issues about the law as a social institution are engaged with through provocative inputs and lively exchanges. So we chose two very provocative and hopefully lively people to kick us off today. The second purpose of the series is to showcase diverse forms of knowledge that trouble normative conceptions of law in society. And we're going to do that by drawing on the thinking and the experiences of scholars, of activists, of social commentators, and of legal practitioners. So we want a wide range of people who are engaging from different places and spaces with law and, and its use. And finally, we want to, and I think very importantly for the faculty, to situate both legal theory and practice in context, in our times, in these moments, so that we can then interrogate the role and impact both theory and practice have on contemporary struggles for social justice. So that's the purpose of, of the seminar series. I'm not going to belabor it, but look out for upcoming posters on, on new events. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, also from the Center for Law and Society, Nalundi Luwayo, who's going to facilitate this conversation, introduce today's specific topic and our speakers, and then um, invite you all to engage with discussions. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, as Mel said, I'm just going to speak very briefly about today's topic. Uh, as the posters would have told you today, the discussion is about gender violence and the question of whether the law fails. Um, the purpose really is to generate a critical engagement with the potential but also the limits of national laws and policies um, and their application in addressing gender-based violence in South Africa and for those of us who are part of the university community um, to think about that in relation to the specific university context. We asked our speakers to help us um, work through and think through some central questions, and those are what the possibilities are um, that current laws and current policy frameworks offer to actively counter gender-based violence. And we're also interested in just thinking about what the failures are and the limitations are of that legal framework, both in terms of its scope but also in terms of its implementation. And perhaps a particular question that those of us who are part of the university community should hold in the back of our minds um, as we engage with our speakers today is how how um, this uh, concept of law, in its broadest sense, might both hinder but also harness the way in which the university is able to respond to gender-based violence, um, noting in particular the intersection that gender-based violence has with other forms of violent inequality. So just some things for us to think about as we engage in today's discussion. Um, what remains then is for me to introduce our speakers today. Um, the first speaker is, uh, she'll be speaking second actually, uh, is Bronwyn Pithy, an advocate of the High Court. Um, Bronwyn was the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions in the Sexual Offences and Community Affairs Unit of the National Prosecuting Authority from 2000 to 2015. She was a member of the Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development's National Advisory Task Team on the re-establishment of sexual offences courts and was involved in the implementation and management of sexual offences courts nationally. She was responsible for the overall management and prosecution of gender-based based offences in the Western Cape, including the management of the Chutuzela Care Centres. After 15 years, Bronwyn took the decision to leave the NPA, and she is now with the Women's Legal Centre, a non-profit public interest law centre that seeks to achieve equality for women, particularly black women. At the Women's Legal Center, Bronwyn heads the Gender-Based Violence Program and is currently involved in a number of constitutional litigation cases concerning sexual offenses. She holds LLB and LLM degrees from UCT, so welcome back, Bronwyn. Um, our first speaker, who I'm introducing second, is Vivian Mentor Lalu. She is currently a researcher facilitator for the Women and Democracy Initiative at the Dula Omar Institute at UWC. Vivian worked for the Western Cape Network on violence against women for two years, and before that, she worked at the domestic abuse project based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She started working at SWET, a sex worker rights organization in 2002. In 2010, Vivian was appointed as the advocacy and gender coordinator for RAPCAN, a children's rights organization. And in 2013, she assumed the role of national coordinator for the Shugumisa campaign. So both of them really, I think, are some of the key people to have in the room for this conversation. I'd like to invite Vivian to come and kick us off. Um, thanks for the invitation, and I'm pleased to be speaking to you. I've been asked to speak to uh, gender violence, uh, does the law fail? And in my opinion, the short answer is yes. <laughs> so I'm ready to, that answers the question. But obviously, there's a longer version of 
my answer to that question of how the law fails gender-based violence and addressing gender-based violence. So I thought before I launch into my very opinionated ideas around gender-based violence and the law, that I wanted to give you a bit of background, because I'm not sure how many of you in the room maybe or that have your pulse on the issues facing gender-based violence like myself and Bronwyn would have. So what do we know about gender-based violence in South Africa? And I think one of the key problems would be that there isn't coherent studies that give us a full picture of the extent and factors of gender-based violence in South Africa. Um, it's been named as one of the key um, problems and the reason why it is a problem is that how do you begin to address a problem if you don't know its extent? And so, the, yeah, we just really don't know. But we don't know nothing. There are some things that we do know. And uh, Bronwyn, who's been in the, in the D Department of Justice for a long time, know that those of us from civil society have been profoundly frustrated with, um, for example, the criminal stats that come out of SAPS. So that's what I wanted to actually show you. We're looking at the height of the red. I don't know if you can see that. So that is the total amount of recorded sexual offenses for 2013-2014, which is 62,649 cases that sexual offenses reported to SAPS, to the police. And that is, I think there are like 24 offenses under the Sexual Offenses Act, which is one of the key pieces of law that addresses the issue of gender-based violence in South Africa. If you look at, this is a, a screen a clip that I took from the uh, report submitted by the Department of Justice to Parliament. And if you look at what they do with the 2013 stats, so you can see at the bottom there, new cases, it's 10,800. So somewhere between SAPS and the prosecuting authority, 50,000, they disappeared. We are not sure, you know, what happened with those cases. So you're beginning to see how the attrition rate, and those are for reported cases. So when, interestingly, when the prosecuting authority does its math, and in its annual report for that same period, it will tell you that it has a 60-odd percent prosecution rate. But that is because it's measuring its prosecution rate only on the cases that it's finalized. So it's not looking at its prosecution rate at what we would want to be seeing to the cases that made that women reported to the police. So for us, the prosecution rate, it is really low. You're looking at maybe six, seven percent of women that present to police stations, cases go to trial. So uh, that gives you an indication of the extent of the problem within the criminal justice system. So that's the one piece of stats that we do have that gives us a picture of what's happening within the criminal justice system. Some of the other things that we know, for example, is that I think was it in 2014 that Gender Links and the Medical Research Council did a research study on the extent of gender-based violence in Gauteng province. And they found, let me tell you, that um, of this sample, 75% of men admitted to perpetrating some kind of violence towards women, and that is for Gauteng province. There was also a study done by KPMG to look at the extent of the economic consequences of gender-based violence. And for that, they found for a very similar period, uh, 2013 period, that um, between, what did I say? Let me read it to you. I'm not really good at remembering. So between 28.4 and 42.4 billion rand could be attributed and lost because of gender-based violence. So it's a cost to South Africa. So I don't think anyone would disagree that the issue of gender-based violence is a huge problem for South Africa and that we in fact face high levels of underreporting as well. So what is going on? Why is it so high post our democracy? And why with really, really good laws that we have in place, many would say the laws are fairly good and that they are good policies on paper. Why have we not been able to shift the high levels of gender-based violence 
in South Africa, and particularly your interest in law, why has the criminal justice system failed to address the issue of gender-based violence in any meaningful way, as far as, as I, would, I would say? I think that we should start probably to look at the issue of the high levels of inequality in South Africa. Gender inequality, we're looking at patriarchal values. How does that relate to the criminal justice system? So a, um, a concrete example would be that many officials within the criminal justice system don't think that gender-based violence is an issue. They believe that it should be addressed in the home. Um, and so you see how that translates into uh, how they respond to gender-based violence from police station to courtroom. Um, and it's not taken seriously. And I don't know, and maybe you can tell me what you think, because I'm not sure how the law addresses structural issues like that. How does a piece of legislation like the Sexual Offences Act or the Domestic Violence Act that are primarily there to uh, respond to some issues of gender-based violence, how can law address that structural issues? Because we are talking about gender inequality, we're talking about patriarchy. Can the law do that? Um, we, haven't, we haven't seen it, so <laughs> maybe you can tell me in your theory what you think in your classes. So. The other thing that I think is an indication of how gender-based violence isn't taken seriously is that when you look at when, the, when laws were promulgated, like the Domestic Violence Act and the Sexual Offences Act, we noticed immediately that there aren't funding, there isn't budget dedicated to the implementation of those acts. So, as a popular phrase that we know is, show me the money. So at civil society, we have now begun to look for that as a measure, how seriously is government about actually making something work is where is it in the budget? And we have seen time and time again, things on paper and no, no resources allocated uh, to actually implementing those things. So huge failure, it seems very obvious to us but it ha it's been going on for a while and it happens time and time again. Uh, not too long ago, um, the minister, the previous Minister of Justice um, declared that they're gonna roll out sexual offenses courts, which we all welcomed. Um, and there's be it's been shown that dedicated sexual offenses court does help uh, prosecution and the experiences of survivors going through the system, but yet there was no funding dedicated to the establishment of these additional um, sexual offences courts. So that, that would be a, a concrete example for you. So the other thing that we have noted, which um, has been coming on for a long time, another reason that makes it really hard to keep track of gender-based violence is that we don't have an offence as domestic violence in South Africa. So in fact, even through police stats, you can't track the, the incidences and the levels of domestic violence. It could be um, you know, common assault, it could be moving through the criminal justice system as common assault, it could be murder, um, it could be more serious forms of assault. So we actually cannot even through police stats, which is the one stats we have at our disposal, track the levels of domestic, reported domestic violence through South Africa. The other thing, that we've seen that has really troubled us is this thing of what some researchers have called a perverse incentive. So we have seen that because, say, say the police, for example, want to show that they are reducing the amount of reported sexual offenses cases, that they in fact turn women away or discourage women from laying a charge. And we have been trying to get SAPs to say, hey, why don't you say the more reported cases of sexual offenses you get, the better you are doing, because it would indicate that you, the system is actually open to women coming forward and women feel safe and confident in a criminal justice system rather than watching for a reduction um, in the current context in South Africa. So 
my colleague Sam, she also, something that really, that she feels really passionately about, is this issue of consequences and accountability of officials in the system. Because actually people are just not doing their jobs. There are very clear policies and guidelines for what is expected of officials throughout the criminal justice system and how these laws should be implemented. And frankly, a lot of them are not doing their jobs and they are doing so without any consequences for them. I think for, for most of us in uh, informal employment, should we have a, a job description and we're not meeting it, you can expect to be hauled over the coals for it, at least be given some performance review or something to say, hey, you know, pull up your socks. And so that's one of the things for her, because we see such uneven implementation. We see some sections of the criminal justice system doing really well with their resources, and we see others doing really poorly. And it's sometimes hard to make sense of the fact that you see this really unequal, unpredictable performance throughout the system. We suspect it has to do with individual people as well and how they perform, and it shouldn't. People should be doing their jobs within the system. I wanted to also just briefly raise the issue for you, which is something that myself and Sam work on quite extensively, and it's the issue of oversight within Parliament as a gap. Now, you all would have heard about the huge failure of oversight coming from Parliament with the grant stuff, you know, the cases of the Department of Social Development. Um, as well as a few years ago, the textbook saga in Limpopo. And there really the question is, yes, it's a failure of the executive, the, the Department of Social Development, and in the Limpopo case, the Department of Education. However, Parliament and those portfolio committees in Parliament have a duty to provide oversight over the executive. They should have seen these things coming for years. They should have seen these things coming to us and they should have called the executive to order. And we see that parliament also is not executing its mandate to hold the executive accountable. And for us, in the context of gender-based violence, that's another critical gap. Why, why are the portfolio committees within parliament, the Justice and Correctional Services Portfolio Committee, um, the Police Portfolio Committee, not checking the executive on why are these conviction rates so low? How are you spending your money? Where's the money for GBV? And we are not seeing that. So the responsibility has fallen on, on civil society and academic institutions to try and hold the executive accountable. So I, in me highlighting the gaps, you can also hear the solutions, I hope anyway, um, that you can see where we think things can be tightened and things can be streamlined and that even though it's so flawed, we are hopeful that it's a system that can actually work in the best interest of survivors, um, millions and millions of survivors, survivors of gender-based violence in South Africa. And I'll leave it there. I look forward to your comments and questions in the discussion section. Thank you. Just briefly, my, my history is that I, I studied law um, in the 80s and early 90s, and um, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was a fascinating time to study law because there were all these changes that were kind of happening, were about to happen, everything was being challenged. It was a fantastic time. I then made the fatal mistake of going to do my articles, um, where suddenly there was this other face of law which was all commercial, and I thought, no, I should go and do that because that's good to get those skills. So it took a few months to realize this was like definitely not what I was going to do. But I plugged it out and finished my article, so at least I had that, and thought I'm never going to practice as an attorney, ever, ever. Um, so I got involved, went out of that, and went into civil society with an NGO, um, and then became very critical of government, of really what government was doing around sexual offenses in particular. And um, in meetings with certain people within the National Prosecuting Authority, one of the directors in the organization said, OK, well, stop making so much noise and come and work for us and fix it. So I said, OK, I'll give it a shot. So there I went into the abyss. Um, and for 15 years, um, swam upstream, really. But really believing that there was something that I could do or that we could do. So what I wanted to talk about a bit today was 
the, the kind of framework around which South Africa exists. I'm not going to do lots of theory because you've got it all. You've probably studied at least some of it. And if you're interested, you can always follow up on it. So I'm not going to go into that a lot. What I am going to try and do is follow up a bit from what Vivian has said um, and build a little bit on that in terms of what we can actually do. I think if you, if you hear, I mean, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, but if, you, if you hear what Vivian is saying, the bottom line is or could be law is a useless thing to have around gender-based violence. And if any of you are thinking of going into it or using the law, don't bother. Go and do commercial or whatever it is because there, there, there really isn't a place for law, um, which, is, which is quite depressing for, for, for on, one, on one hand. But I mean, I, I personally believe that there is a place for law. There's a very, very real place for law in, t in terms of gender, gender violence. And then I think it can be very effective, but it depends how, how we use it. Okay, and I have no idea how to move these slides. Is it this thing? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, well, there we go. So I'm not going to go through any of this stuff, but I think it's important to know that one of the things that we draw on so much of the time is all the constitutional rights that exist certainly in the Constitution and then into the Bill of Rights. But how, how, what's important is how you take those rights and weave them into gender-based violence. The one that we use the most, I think, is the, is the Section 121C, which is the right to be free from all forms of violence, whether it comes from a public or private source, which helps us keep both the state and private spaces or private institutions accountable. And if we've got time, I can, I can maybe talk to you about some of the cases that we've done over the years. When I say we, I must actually qualify that. I now, after I was at the NPA, I left after 15 years, took a year to recover, um, and then have started working for the Women's Legal Center six months ago, which is a fantastic um, organization. It's a public interest constitutional litigation um, law firm and um, really, you know, basically attaches itself around constitutional issues around gender. Gender-based violence being one of them, we look at relationship rights, property, health rights, etc. Um, so the, 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 the things that we have to find or hang our, our work on is the constitutional obligations. Then, hmm, wrong one. The, the Constitutional Court has, in various cases, addressed violence against women directly, which has been very useful around accountability again. So there are a number of cases that have said that the state does have an obligation to protect people, protect women from, from violence. Um, there is an obligation on the state to pass legislation and have policy and have structures that actually must address, legis at least uh, address violence. Um, there is case law that says that not just a law, or not just a policy is enough, that government actually have to make available their plans, their actual practical plans for implementation. So that's really useful to be, a to be able to hold the state accountable through, the through that mechanism. We also have all of the international legal obligations um, around CEDAW, African Charter, um, the Protocol on Gender and Development, those are also just useful to have and it indicates that there is government commitment to it, whether they say it on paper or whether it actually plays out are two different things. Then, Vivian alluded to some of the legislation that exists in, in, in South Africa, the Domestic Violence Act and then the Sexual Offences Act, which we more commonly referred to it as, as, as SORMA, which is the Criminal Law, Sexual Offences and Related Matters Amendment Act, which was the piece of legislation that came in and repealed most of the common law around sexual offences, broadened the definition of rape, um, was very far more inclusive in terms of the penetrative offences, it recognised all the non-penetrative offences, um, and it recognised a whole lot of new offences, particularly against children and disabled people. It's a very good piece of legislation. It's tight with the actual the offences and um, there have been some challenges to it. They casually forgot to put in punishment clauses which had to be challenged and, and then changed. Overall I think it's a good piece of legislation and then the various things that actually back it up, whether it's things like the Victims Charter, whether it's pieces atta things attached to the actual act around regulations, um, all of those things have been 
quite helpful. And again, there is this commitment to providing complainants, so they say of sexual effects, as the maximum and least traumatizing protection. And that language, if you think about it, really comes from civil society over the years. It comes from an acknowledgement and recognition of how civil society, through experiences of working directly with women and children who have been survivors or victims of sexual offences, have influenced the process. And I really do believe that civil society led this process. Because although there were people in government um, that eventually drafted and crafted this legislation. It really was through civil society. And that's why I think that the role of civil society, I'm going off a little bit here, but the role of civil society is absolutely vital in the issues around gender-based violence. I'm not saying it's not, it's vital in a lot of issues like education, etc. cetera. But that's, that's obviously not where, where, where I come from. But I can see the effect and the holding of accountability on the state. And, and something that I think is also very important to understand when one is trying to hold the state accountable, accountable is that there is definitely a developing ethos within government of becoming more and more closed. The access to information opportunities are closing down. Um, the state is becoming more and more um, defensive. It is very worried about litigation. Um, <coughs> And, and, I mean, you can see that across the board. I mean, we just have to look at what's happening in court today. Um, you know, in terms of the, the, the rigidness of the state. So it's becoming more and more difficult for society to use the law to um, access information and to, and to influence the way that government is, is, is implementing. But I do think it is a, still a very, a very powerful tool was a bit of a digression. My last slide is really about does it actually address the lived experiences of women? My answer, like I said just now, is yes and no. It definitely doesn't change the majority of women's lives who are exposed to violence. I mean, some of the things that are happening in, in the news recently, the, 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 the taxi rapes in Joburg, I mean, how do we even start making sense of that kind of thing? Some of the studies that Vivian referred to, the, the levels of, of violence that, that men admit to in, in the study by the MRC, you know, th those things are, are, are really con concerning. But I do believe that it does have a role to play. And I think of something like, you also alluded to it, was, is the sexual offences courts. There is no doubt in my mind that sexual offences courts work if they are implemented properly. And one of the amendments to the Sexual Offences Act is around sexual offences courts. The government, once again, is dragging its heels around implementation. I can tell you it's about resourcing. But th the argument around resourcing has to be that if you commit policy-wise, legislation-wise, etc., you have to attach a budget to it. And I think Vivian is absolutely right that the next point of entry around government and accountability is allocation of resources. It has to be. Because we are very good as a country at going overseas and telling everyone what a marvelous job we're doing around violence against women, but we're not committing the, the, the resources to it. Um, there is a case that we're involved in, um, some of you may know it, it's the um, Social Justice Coalition case against the Minister of Police and a number of other um, parties. Um, essentially following on from the Kai Leacher Commission that was held four years ago, um, to some extent challenging the police that they haven't implemented aspects of the recommendations. But one of the main issues, well, the main issue that they are attacking is that the, the, the method that is used for the allocation of resources of police in, um, in across the board results in discrimination based on, the ra on, the, on, based on race and poverty. And what we're bringing in is the gender aspect. And that is a really useful, I mean, it would be a very useful and interesting case to follow because it's going to be interesting what the court is going to say around the powers of the executive and the powers of the department and how much influence a court can have in directing the minister to allocate resources in a particular way which results in addressing discrepancies on, on, on race and hopefully gender. We obviously want them very much to address gender. So that's going to be really, and I, and, and I suspect it's in the High Court um, here in, in, in Cape Town, and I suspect that it will go to the Constitutional Court eventually. So that, that's, that, that, that would be one aspect of resourcing 
that the way that they are using the allocation of resourcing is is totally flawed. It's basically it's it's basically problematic. Um, just very very briefly, I think working within and out the system that that I have done over the years, working in the system. I often say that the people that I actually had the most trouble with and who I had the most fights with, for lack of a better word, were the people in the system. I, 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 I mean, I was always a bit odd anyway. The, 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 I, I didn't really fit the, the kind of state bureaucratic or bureaucrat role. They thought I was weird. They thought I was some kind of radical feminist all the time. And, and, and so, but, it, but the irony of it is, is that I probably actually wasn't that, that, that wild with my ideas. You know, in civil society, it, it was, what was what people wanted. But it, it was an indication, again, of how narrow, I can't say narrow-minded, but the, the, the approach is very narrow. It's a very bureaucratic way of doing it. You have a case, you prosecute it, or you investigate it, and that's what you do. You just go through, go through the system or go through the steps which doesn't really address the complexities and the nuances around gender-based violence. So the two ways that, that, that I believe there, there is room to move on addressing gender violence is around law reform, which to a large extent has happened. There is still room for law reform, but then also around litigation, which I, which I, which I touched on, and, and if necessary, we, we can talk about it. I'm, go I'm going to stop there, and then maybe if there are more discussions or questions around things, we can we can take it from there. Uh, I would just like to ask how the benefits of uh, special sexual offences courts manifest themselves. Um, is it because the judicial officers in those contexts are specially trained to deal with these issues, or is it because like an, an approachability thing that less offences will slip through the cracks? Uh, what are the benefits? What have shown to be the benefits of, of these courts? And and if it is indeed about the special training of the judicial officers, is there perhaps room for um, judges to be trained rather than uh, for these dealing with these specific issues rather than establishing new courts? From what you've both said, the law is fine, the implementation sucks. But as Vivian pointed out, it's got to work through Parliament and the executive too. I'm, I'm busy working on this in the moment, at the moment as a constitutional lawyer, but we're ending up in a situation where the courts are the only place to go to because everyone else is just not interested or completely inaccessible. Um, and my growing suspicion is that when that happens, the courts actually can't help us either. So um, the response needs to be more than uh, litigation. And I'm wondering... I mean, they okay, I'm asking you to set up a campaign to save South Africa, but I'm wondering if you can suggest other avenues whereby the law can be made to work. Because we actually cannot do it with only one branch of government actually doing its job. I just wanted to know, uh, working for the NPA, what role the Gender Commission had, and if what you think they could be doing better, what they're not doing well. Um, and then in terms of the law, uh, we were talking about, uh, you, you work for SWEAT. Yeah, I'm just interested to see or hear your opinion on um, where um, sex work um, and the law is at the moment and the progression of that kind of movement. Uh, my question is really concerning the statistics for reported cases. I noticed there's a very high reportage in Gauteng in the Western Cape and around the Eastern Cape. So I was wondering, is it really just because of like a reflection of the statistics in the provinces, or it's because of resource allocation? And if it's because of resource allocation, can something be done to try and push the state to actually allocate resources in other areas like you know, Limpopo so that more cases can be dealt with? What is it that NGOs can do to hold government officials more accountable? Uh, more specifically, the maybe the lower level government officials, such as police officers, who actually take the first report, um, rather than looking at it at a larger scale, like going to court and, and parliament. What can be done to hold the the lower people more accountable? Um, the issue of litigation as the only option to get some kind of traction is a concern, um, and I think 
if you if you know that the, the intention was this idea of separation of powers between the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive, that they hold each other in check. And what we are finding is the skewing of those powers, which is which is not ideal. Um, and so for us at the Dalla Omar Institute, our mission is to strengthen parliament and to strengthen democracy and to strengthen those functions as a way of ensuring that parliament does its role. And because at the moment we have a situation where the executive is extremely powerful and um, parliament, and that's part of a, for a range of reasons. And I'm not going I don't have the time to really go into why that is the case and the range of possibilities to correct that. And not that anybody agrees on that anyway. So the other issue for me has always been that, um, and to answer the question around sweat and where sweat is at as well for me, was that sweat has, has been successful in a few litigations and unsuccessful in some. But even in the cases where they've had some success, you didn't see that translate into any real changes for sex workers on the ground. So where they won a case against the police to stop issuing unfair arrest orders, for example, a few years ago. Women are still being arrested indiscriminately for loitering or whatever. Um, and I think that what a lot of civil society organizations are doing now is combining the idea of active citizenship and social mobilization with litigation. And, the, and obviously it's a funding dependent and it's heavy resource and you must be committed to tackle this issue long term. It's not just running to the court, getting a judgment, and then it's done. So I think that, unfortunately, the answers are complicated. Um, and so I think that that is. And then just to respond quickly to the issue of stats and why the provinces are looking so different in terms of the reporting of sexual offenses, I think that's part of the problem. So there's a range of possible factors for why that is looking the way it's looking. It could be that there are more awareness campaigns in the Western Cape and Gauteng that encourage women, they're more support, they are more civil society present that support women through the system and therefore encourages, encourage women to go forward. It could also be that in some provinces, this case of that perverse incentive of turning women away. Um, so we actually, and that's part of the, the problem of they not really having a, a a good idea of the extent of sexual violence in the various provinces. But one thing we're pretty sure of, that those low figures doesn't mean that incidences are low, if that makes sense. All right, I'll hand over for Dupanand. Sure. Okay, um, in terms of the sexual offences courts, you know, at the end of the day, and I almost feel like I'm starting at the end, that it doesn't matter how good your structures are, at the end of the day, it's going to depend on the people. and. Even, even where we have had sexual offences courts um, in the past, where everything is in place, I'll tell you about the, the, the various components, but even where we have had things that are totally in place, we still haven't seen appropriate services to victims, survivors, complainants. The, the study that was done um, by the Ministerial Committee really identified three components to a sexual offences court. So you're looking at the structure, you're looking at services, and then support services. The structure is literally that you have a courtroom, you have an intermediary room, you have waiting rooms, you have available toilets for children and adults, you have separation of the accused and the complainant and his or her family. So you have that. Then you have personnel or the actual people who are involved in it. Now, You've got to have good prosecutors, you've got to have good trained magistrates, you've got to have magistrates who actually want to be there. One of the biggest problems we've had with sexual offences courts is judicial officers, magistrates, who do not want to sit in those sexual offences courts for any extended period of time because it traumatises them, it doesn't expose them to other offences, they don't get experience in dealing with murders or frauds or armed robberies when they want to do things like get promotion or apply to be a judge. So they're those kind of things that they don't want to sit in sexual offences courts. They also don't want to sit in, K in courts where only sexual offences are heard. Now, one of the things that we've pushed very hard for in the legislation on sexual offences courts is that the, the, the courts 
only hear sexual offences. And the reason we want to do that is that if you have other cases on the roll, basically sexual offences invariably get pushed out. Um, and also because you're dealing a lot of the time, you know, at least half, if not more, of the victims that are going through the system are children. And working with children is a very complex thing. You have to take your time. Very often it will take a whole day. So one of the things that both magistrates and prosecutors are measured on in terms of performance measurement is your finalization rate. Now, I can prosecute in a, in, a, in a court that deals with frauds and murders and armed robberies, and I can finalize 30 cases a month. Sexual offences, if you're lucky, you can finalise 10, maybe, 8, actually. So then I am measured against a colleague of mine on finalisation rates. I'm just giving you an idea of, of why there is a resistance to it. I do know that they work, though. When they run properly, there's no doubt in my mind that they work because the whole system is geared to run the victim. And I'm sorry, I use victim. You see, I, I, it's, it's, it happens because that's the kind of language that we use and has been used in the criminal justice system. So the whole, the whole system will revolve around the central person, and the central person, at the end of the day, is your complainant, your victim, your survivor. And if everyone is moving towards that goal, um, you... You, you ensure a better witness. You ensure someone who's going to stay in the system. Vivian spoke about attrition rates. Our attrition rates are appalling, absolutely appalling. Dee has done a lot of research on attrition rates. There are lots of reasons for it. The main reason is the criminal justice system fails people and they have no interest in participating in it. But the central question is why do we even have a criminal justice system then? Why don't we just throw it out? What is the point of prosecution? Why do we even pursue these things? Why should we tell women and children that they should report rape? Because if we can't guarantee that anything's going to happen with the case and they're going to be treated decently, then why even bother? So I do believe that if you have a system that works, which unfortunately a lot of the time doesn't work, but if it does work, the, the process through which that person can go, first of all, I think can be a very healing process. I think if you're treated well. You know, I've, I've dealt with, with victims where at the end of the day we haven't secured a conviction. It's just been, for, for whatever reasons, the, the evidence hasn't been strong enough. There's been a technicality, etc. But that person, through that process, has been treated with absolute respect and treated with understanding and treated in a way that actually puts him or her at the centre of the case. And they come out of that process still saying, thank you, it was, it was worth going through it. It did something for me. The other cases where you've got a conviction, basically that person is destroyed through the process. So I do, I do believe that there is, I don't know if I've really answered your question, but I do believe there is a place for sexual offences courts. I believe that they run properly. I do think that with all the things that you put in place, at some stage you actually have to use a very tight monitoring mechanism. You have to have complaints mechanisms. And it actually goes to the question that you asked in terms of what can people do on the ground? What can NGOs do on the ground? The very quick answer is know what the law is. Because if you can be advocates for the people that you are working with or working for, to be able to say in a police station, I know that these are the things that, that a complainant is entitled to. These are the processes that you must follow. And as soon as you, they don't, you don't get that, that you have a chain of command, which is how the police work, and prosecutors, in terms of your complaints mechanisms. And there are structures, there are some really strong... NGOs, CBOs out there that are very happy to like take people on um, in in the system and have, have have done amazing things in various courts, changed prosecutors, made sure that the magistrates are the best people, changed changed investigating officers and things. But it has to be it's 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 an ongoing battle. There's no doubt. And I think what you're saying. I mean, I don't have an answer around the litigation. I know that that is. There's a part of me that thinks that's what I know how to do and that's I'm going to keep doing that because to say that I'm going to do other things, I don't have skills and other things. But I do think that activism, we, we need like another, I can't say it, I shouldn't say revolution, but we, we need another, another wave of actually challenging the state in a, in a, in a, in a very thought through, pointed way without, 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 I'm talking far too much, I'm sorry, I get very, I get, I get very, um, I'm very, yeah, I feel very passionately about this. I'm very loath to comment on the Commission for Gender Equality um, because I think that 
in their defence, I think that they have been hamstrung mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, which doesn't surprise me at all, since it's a gender commission. I think their budgets have been low. I think they, with respect to the various people who have been there, I think they've appointed some of the wrong people. Um, and I think they've been set up to fail. And unfortunately, to a large extent, I think they have. I think there was individuals there that are amazing, that have done some really amazing job, uh, work, but I think a lot of them have left because of their levels of frustration. I don't know if, I've, if there's anything else. I think that's about it.